cher public, vous venez de visionner le film Tellurian Drama, euh, réalisé par le cinéaste indonésien Ria Rizaldi. Sélectionné en compétition internationale par le Festival Cinéma du Réel, Tellurian Drama fait partie des sept films sélectionnés par le jury de la Bulac, la Bibliothèque Universitaire des Langues et Civilisations. En ce mois de mars 2021, à l'heure où les salles de cinéma et l'auditorium du pôle des langues et civilisations sont encore clos en raison du contexte sanitaire, la Bulac a le grand plaisir de pouvoir partager avec vous euh, cette nouvelle édition du réel, selon quelques règles du jeu euh, habituelles et d'autres un peu plus inédites. Dans quelques instants, vous aurez ainsi l'opportunité d'écouter « Dialoguer », dans les conditions du direct, Riyar Rizaldi, le réalisateur euh, depuis Hong Kong, Christine Cabassé, géographe spécialiste de l'Asie du Sud-Est, basée à Bangkok, et Alice Monin, étudiante en cinéma, qui nous fait l'honneur de sa présence ici à la Bulac. Ria Rizaldi est un artiste plasticien et cinéaste, né en Indonésie et vivant actuellement à Hong Kong. Il s'intéresse principalement à la relation entre capital et technologie, à l'extractivisme et à la fiction théorique. Christine Cabassé est docteur en géographie et aménagement à l'Université Paris-Sorbonne 4. Elle est chercheuse pour l'Institut de recherche sur l'Asie du Sud-Est contemporaine et chercheuse associée au Centre Asie du Sud-Est. Elle a mené plusieurs missions d'expertise en Asie du Sud-Est liées à l'aménagement, à l'étude du tourisme et du développement durable. Alice Monin est étudiante à l'université Sorbonne Nouvelle Paris 3, en Master 2 de recherche en études cinématographiques et à l'ENS Ulm au sein du département des arts. L'équipe de la Bulac remercie ses trois invités d'avoir généreusement répondu à son invitation, ainsi que l'équipe du Festival Cinéma du Réel, et maintenant, place au débat. So you can see my face. Um, so thank you, uh, Ria Rizaldi, to be here with uh, us uh, and uh, Dr. Cabasse uh, also to have a conversation about so the very uh, interesting uh, film, which is Tellurian Drama. So maybe... Uh, Um, uh, Christine Cabasse, Christine Cabasse uh, you can tell us about your, your, your first impressions about this film, uh, the film of Ria Rizaldi. Yes, uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon uh, to, to everyone, or good evening, uh, good morning, sorry, in France. Um, yeah, I, I was uh, very impressed and I really appreciated um, the Ria Rizaldi film. Uh, I thought uh, it was a movie very rich, very dense, very rich. And um, uh, for, for many kinds of reasons, but also because he used a lot of different documents from the film one was on the site and uh, to the archives. And also because there was um, What this story is telling us is a, a kind of geo-history of one side, and I will come back to the point. And from the whole movie, for me, it emerged uh, a, a poetry uh, from this movie, uh, from the sound, especially the sound text uh, is taking a, a very important place in the movie, in the film. Um, and also because of the time. So time is also a major topic uh, uh, Ria is exploring and we can come back on the point. Um, yeah, but the time also because he stay uh, on, on fixed image for sometimes for quite uh, a long time. Um, and, and, and another general uh, feeling is that um, Uh, Ria Rizaldi is uh, filming the site as if it was a powerful place. And this is a kind of contrast. So this is why I really like also the movie, because you can see it as a powerful place. And at the same time, you can see the, the, the place like a kind of lost place. So, yeah. 
And, and for me, what was interesting is that um, we can read, you, we can see this film uh, through the lens of history and through this place, you can have a kind of Indonesian history. We will come back on it. Uh, you can have the lens of geography and the lens of ecology and uh, spirituality. So I would like to start, and then after we can uh, we can share the, the flow, of course. And uh, but I would like to start with the geography. So um, uh, I talked, I just talked about the power, powerful place, and uh, actually the title itself speaks for itself. I mean, Telurian, Telurian drama. So Telurian, Telurik. So this is a, a movie talking about uh, forces of the earth. And this place is powerful also because of Telurik forces that uh, the whole Indonesia knows, experiments because of uh, volcanology, uh, seismic activity, and this all uh, coastal uh, areas, southern coastal areas of the Sunda Islands are rich in volcanoes uh, and the place that was chosen for uh, this film is also a volca volcanic place and uh, this site is precisely uh, on the feet of two uh, kind of volcanoes at least uh, on the, on the uh, feet of two, of two peaks yeah, so I have plenty of questions and I could talk <laughs> a long time for a long time about it, but we can come back. So the first question is, uh, why did you choose, how did you come to work to, on this topic or and on this um, site? Yeah, um, thanks a lot for that. Uh, yeah, that's pretty interesting way to put and to interpret the films. But uh, to answer the questions is, I'm actually a big fan of radio, like listening to the radio. And I'm really attached to this experience. Uh, when I was a kid listening to like radio drama and radio play, it's, a, it's kind of like big in Indonesia back in the 90s, the radio drama. And at some point I was um, try to kind of like observe maybe what's the history of radio in Indonesia? That's the big questions that comes up just all of a sudden to me. And I started to research, I started to, to, find, to find the history of radio. And yeah, eventually I'm, I find this site, the place, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Radio Malabar. And Radio Malabar surprisingly located really close to my parents' house in Bandung in West Java. So, yeah, it's, a, it's something that I haven't heard before. And then it's it's really kind of like only several people who knows this site. Uh, especially there's no like um, history written in the textbooks and nobody knows the history of this radio. I mean, like mainstream Indonesia and like uh, uh, a lot of people in Indonesia, in Indonesia, they don't really know the history of this place. So I try to actually research it and try to find the history of this place and a lot of the history of this place is actually written from the perspective of the um you know colonial history like the the reason why the dutch uh, indonesia was uh, uh colonized by the dutch um, and then at the time why the, the why the dutch needs to make a radio station and that's really interesting but the, the other point that i want to also um try to see is actually the micro history, like the history that uh, actually understood by the people who lives around that area. So that's kind of like the starting point. It's, um, it's, uh, yeah, the departure is the history of the place, but also at the same time, I'm, I'm also like, um, interested in talking a lot about the, um, relation of, you know, the, the materiality of the history of radio and then why the radio is there. And also at the same time, I'm also interested in kind of like um, try to talk about it or try to discuss about it from not really like, uh, how do I say it, like the documentary point of view, but also like somehow mix it with a little bit of fiction. So 
that's that's I think that's kind of like the starting point. But yeah, but to answer your question, it's it's really my interest in radio. It's just like that's how um, I want to research about this place, and then eventually it becomes these films. So it kind of like evolves. Um, yes. Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, it's really interesting what you say about. Um, this place, which uh, in a way it's uh, uh, it, uh, it's hidden from the um, human and in the in the nature, uh, mm -hmm. uh, far from in the in the mountains. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I really like this um, this aspect in the film because in uh, like in the in the first shot of the film, you are in a way like um, an explorer because you are mm. walking uh, in the vegetation and you are searching for something, but you, uh, we, we don't know, the spectator uh, don't know what, what is it uh, at the beginning. So I also really like this aspect of uh, the filmmaker, so you as a, an explorer, but also in a way as um, an, an archaeologist, because uh, you find uh, those, those uh, ruins uh, of uh, Radio Malabar. And um, thanks to those, uh, those, those physical uh, ruins, you, you start to, to introduce the past uh, through different media. So um, I wanted to ask you first, um, why um, did you choose to um, yes to use different media like uh, archive footage, uh, like your shot, uh, also the, the uh, appearance of the text on the images, and uh, then also um, the sort of diagrams, um, yes, um, mm. on the image. Yeah, I'm really interested in this idea of. Uh... I would say it's kind of like a cosmic filmmaking practice, which is like using a lot of archiving that already shot or already, you know, made by people, I don't know, from like 50 years, 60 years uh, before me, and then try to build a narrative based on that. So it's kind of like also my, always my attempt in filmmaking is always mixing a lot of styles and a lot of uh, methods as well to create this, um, almost like, a, I don't know, it's almost kind of like seeing filmmaking practice as like really large collective practices. So, you know, it's not only like my films, but I also like use a lot of material from people back um, way before me and try to kind of like navigate it from this archiving and to create a new, some no, maybe not new, but kind of like novel, a novel way of uh, telling the stories. Um, yeah, and I and I'm 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 just like really like the idea of using you know, found materials, and I guess it's also like the the idea before it's also I'm 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 also uh, I'm a big fan of this uh, commentary DVDs back in the days. So you always have this kind of like um, I don't know directors commentaries or whatever, and I always see that kind of like practice as some sort of also like a filmmaking practice. So that's also like inform my practice to to use a lot of style and, and and methods but yeah but it's always it's always in my practice to mix uh, methods and style and not really like uh ha not ha not only having like a singular uh, methodology or like singular approach to filmmaking in a way it's a sort of experimental also i think aspect yeah. of your film which i i really like with this all this media mixed together and sometimes superimposed so yeah it's it's really interesting yeah um maybe uh, yeah. yes christine cabasse yes yes I, yeah i would like i mean you you just uh you just said um that you were interested in uh, showing and talking about the um, uh, the, the history seen uh, through the eyes of the inhabitants, mm. and so I mean the lo the, the, the locals. Uh, but at the same time, we don't see much of them, mm. and um, you evoke them. I mean, we see pictures. Uh, or you also have some footage with um, with uh, 
the people cleaning the areas and so on, just uh, in 2020. Mm. But we don't see much then. Um, so um, you can maybe elaborate on it and uh, tell us why. But I come also with a second question, especially because um, what was, I mean, I was a bit uh, surprised with the fact that uh, uh, twice in 87 and in 2000, someone, so someone, the authority, national yeah. authority pro probably, came with a project of so-called tourism. So first one was campsite. This, the second project was, uh, is about historical sites and still a campsite. But when you see your images, this uh, doesn't seem to be very alive. Uh, we, don't, we cannot feel, and uh, yeah, we cannot feel uh, a real human activity or economic activity or even any activity. So yeah. Yeah, it's uh, so. I guess there's like one interview I had with the basically the the guardian of the that site, and then he was saying about that the. There's no inhabit. Uh, there's no inhabitants anymore because they moved to the foothill. So in that in that around that area, it's basically like really empty, and it's only him. But it's also like really interesting to think about that. The you know at some point there's a lot of kind of like the history of the people who were there before, and I am also like really focusing on that uh, on that kind of like aspect, um, the history of the people in there, and then how. They they kind of like uh, see or like uh, they understand the, the the project the Radio Malabar back in the time, but also at the same time I guess this is also why I call it Tellurian drama because it's like um, Tellurian as the inhabitant of of the earth and then there's so much kind of like a, a transformation of idea and also transformations of like. Uh, uh, a relationship between the site and the people like for example before the colonialism people are think about this uh, mountain as some sort of kind of like you know, um, to project their idea about geology to project their idea about the nature and then they see music or, or like vibration from the music as some sort of kind of like a, a communication and then after that there's a um, colonialism and then colonialism thinks differently but also kind of like it at, still at the same framework to see the mountain as some sort of also like communicative technology. For example, they use it uh, as an antenna to basically using um, transmit the radio telegraphy to to the uh, Dutch uh, motherland, to the mainland Dutch, uh, mainland Netherlands. And uh, that's really interesting. But then after that, after the colonialism, there we also have the Suharto regime, which is the military dictatorship. And then the Suharto regime thinks differently, but still it this, in the same kind of like um, a framework of uh, exploit, the quote unquote exploitation, meaning that uh, he tried to, uh, he tried to actually using the, the that area to be a homogeneous uh, forest with only like a pine trees uh, for the reason of uh, also like, you know, the, the wood prices, the, uh, for the reason of uh, wood production, like pine production. Also for the investment, kind of like the foreign investment in terms of like uh, plantation, and that's that's kind of like the drama that always happened and evolved in that area. And then, yeah, to uh, in the eighty-seven, and they open it for a public camping ground, but it's actually deserted. Like nobody wants to go to that area. But it's also really interesting in uh, when I shot in there, and that it's also in the film that there's the workers cleaning and everything is actually they um, the, the local government uh, with the support from the, uh, the, the Dutch Ministry of Culture, they want to kind of like creating this uh, historical um, tourism places in the Radio Malabar to commemorate the 100 years of the radio. So when I shot in there in March 2020, before the pandemic, it was actually a really active uh, because the the day I shot, the week after I shot, the Dutch prince actually visit that site. Okay. Yeah, to to kind of like um, uh, uh, um, you know make some kind of like agreement with the local government to um, um, creating this uh, 
I don't know what to call it, uh, but it's something like a historical tourism or like historical education, like tourism site or something like that. Like a museum, but in the outdoor, like natural museum or something like that. So the, the workers are starting work in there. And then I think if if I, uh, if I miss or if, if the shoot was postponed to April or like May, I couldn't shot uh, um, the films because it's now it's basically closed for the uh, for the development of the historical sites. So that's also like really interesting. There's a different kind of like level of development of, of the sites because the Suharto regime try to make it like um, to open for the foreign investment, but then it's failed. And then he tried to make it like the public camping ground, but it's also deserted. Uh, like nobody wants to come there. It's not really lively. And it's the ruins is just like filled with nature, you know, nature tax back, uh, tax back. And then now it's uh, uh, with the Dutch uh, government, uh, with the Dutch support, they starting to to create this historical site. So that's the, that's the evolution of the sites, which is quite interesting, I think, uh, in terms of like trajectory and how the drama, like, you know, happening in just in one side. Um, it's really interesting what you say about all those different, um, like, temporal strata at different period during the the 20th century because they are at the same time um, with all this presence of nature uh, sort of vegetal strata like uh, there is maybe uh, thinking linked to the you know the anthropocene uh, preoccupation mm. and different geolo ge geological time and um, so all what you describe is very uh, real, very concrete about this history, this past history, uh, and I, so I wanted to ask you why um, did you decide to uh, introduce um, a part of uh, fiction, of science fiction, through uh, so the character of uh, Doctor mm. Munawan in your film? Yeah, it was. Uh, it's I, it's always kind of like also my method, the mixing fiction and and uh, I won't say it fact but it's actuality so it's like uh one of the reason is like i really like the writings of uh 70s 80s 90s indonesian environmental movement um because back in, back back at the time the only you know uh, the only allow uh, the Suharto regime only allowed uh environmental movement as some sort of kind of like social movement so if you are, you don't, you cannot have this kind of like ideology or like, you know, whatever, like a subversive act, but if it's environmental, uh, uh, for environmental purposes, that's, that's f totally fine because he, the, the regime, the, the new order regime is always kind of like, um, see the environmental destruction as some kind of like the a result of communism because it's always, uh, they always, uh, citing or like, uh, 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 make an um, uh, try to um, uh, 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 yeah try to to say that you know you can see what's happened in China you can see what's happened in Soviet the environmental is dis destroyed because indus industrialisms and blah 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 so there so the regime only allowed the en environmental movement but this environmental movement they cannot have this kind of like ideological or like political agency. So they basically like uh, what you call now is tree hugger you know like basically just like nature lovers. And um, and then the people who just like wants to preserve nature, uh, they don't have they, they cannot express their political uh, agenda and stuff like that. So to kind of like um, uh, conceal their political agenda, they're using a lot of this pseudo scientific or sometimes really new age or sometimes going back to like really old tradition to kind of like say something about their political agenda. You know, like uh, uh, like this is. Uh, uh, for example, like uh, the, the Suharto regime, the Suharto himself, the, the dictator himself, he always think himself as some kind of a king of Jaffa, you know, like some sort of like the patriarch of Jaffa. And then to kind of like against that idea, so these people, the environmentalists in the in the 70s and uh, mostly in the 80s and the 90s, they always use the Japanese history to say like, yeah, you cannot be like a Japanese king if you destroy it, the 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 the, uh, the ecology the environment so that's kind of like uh, you know the the idea of mixing this uh, almost like cosmological thinking and then really indigenous belief system as some sort of like ecological 
uh, way of thing, uh, as well as using a lot of like pseudoscientific, sometimes really spiritualism. It's really inspiring to me. And then I think um, at the same time, this is also a film that try to make a statement about the condition of Indonesia nowadays, because there's also like um, a, a big discussion about there's a, a new um, bill proposed, uh, actually it's it's already passed, the uh, uh, environmental bill, uh, especially relating to uh, extra, uh, extractive economy. And uh, yeah, and then and especially coal mining and stuff like that. And then it's a film that tried to also reflect with the, this kind of like idea about uh, environmentalism uh, and environmental movement and how it uh, actually have so much struggle right. just to say something about the nature you know like they hold they they have to conceal it they have to kind of like you know yeah. instead of like really straightforward saying something that the regime destroying the ecology they have to kind of like detour and then go to like uh, i don't know some kind of like pseudo-scientific and stuff like that. So I just really like this idea. And then I think it's also re re really relating to like the, the writing of science fiction, especially in the 70s, when they kind of like try to think a lot about the uh, destructions of nature, especially from, um, uh, you know, Ursula Le Guin and then Octavia Butler and, and then all of these more anthropological science fiction writers. So that's kind of like my approach to, to, to yeah, to the character. Yeah, uh, I would say that, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you elaborated a lot on uh, ecology and uh, that's a very uh, um, a strong part of the film, actually, is about ecology, but more, more about ecology. I mean, ecology and the link with spirituality, I would say. Um, so you talk about uh, yeah, deforestation and the loss of bio biodiversity at the different peri period, huh, as you said. Um, but I was especially interested in the fact that in the link that you, or, or the suggestion that you, that you make on the power of nature, you, you, you say nature has, he is powerful. Uh, and this is multiplied also with the, um, and the, the one power of the ancestors and all together could provide a lot of energy and that we could, we could use this energy as a positive, in a positive way in the service uh, of the earth. So, um, and, and so I will have a question on this. And the precise, precise point, but I wanted also to highlight that uh, I like your idea in saying, yeah, I mean, Indonesia could use this uh, mm. energy of nature to be at the forefront of the uh, sustainable development or whatever, I mean, uh, ecology, but, but it's not, and, mm. uh, and we know, uh, as you said, uh, and this is probably why I mean, you have a, a marvelous uh, image of this musician. This is mm. in the final part of the movie. Yeah? This musician uh, at the feet of the Gunung, uh, of, the, of the mountains, and um, in front of the ruins. This is just marvelous. I mean, for me, I thought it was spectacular. And you have this very nice music. But at the same time, you see the, uh, the bottles. And, kind of uh, mm. other uh, plastic waste, uh, mm. not far from the musician. And this reminds that you were talking about ecology and we, we, you show us extraordinary uh, views on the mountain and the vegetation, but at the same time, we feel again and we, see, we can see the, one of the challenges that um, Indonesia is facing. Mm. So I come also to the question, because I was really interested in that point. Uh, at a certain certain time, you say you you talk about the local people and about their belief, and you say they have the ability to communicate with the mountain and to accumulate uh, with accumulated ancestral energy, energy, and this is the method to engineer the earth. Mm. So, could you say more about this local culture, maybe, or yeah? Thank yeah, 
Yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting because that kind of like idea it came from the 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 whole thing about the relation between nature and and human, especially when when we see this, um, especially the ancestral not ancestral maybe the indigenous you know cosmology. When they think about nature, they always think about that. Uh, 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 nature has some sort of kind of like a power and this power comes from the ancestor and then to kind of like uh, maybe not obtain by but, but maybe communicate with that power or quote unquote like use that power as some sort of it's really hard to describe in in yeah to kind of like use this um the energy or like the power of the um uh, the ancestor is they 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 communicate and they they use this kind of like uh, communication as some sort of uh, idea about the engineering in here. It means kind of like transform, like uh, creating their own world, creating their um, uh, idea. Yeah, creating their subjective idea about their uh, relation between the nature and then and then the and then themselves as 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 a people who inhabited in that uh, in that area. So when the Dutch um, so called uh, the, the Dutch colonialists think about that, you know, we can use nature as some sort of like uh, a, a geoengineering process, for example, like using mountains as a transmitter for technology mm -hmm. uh, for this indigenous people. It's like, no, but mountain for us, it's for our kind of like world building process for our kind of like creating this uh, our own environment, our own like spaces, our own sites in here. So engineer in here, it means like the um, construction, construction, or the, the the constructions of the idea of nature for themselves, and then this this um, the whole thing about con constructing the idea of nature is developed through the communication, um, meaning that the communication means like you know you have some sort of like reciprocity between the nature and and the people. So it's not like you are, uh, um, for example. Uh, throwing a plastic bottle and then not doing anything with it because then it will kind of like uh, at some point in in terms of like um, uh, po polluting and stuff like that. But for for the people there, um, for the indigenous people that already not inhabited the, the land, you know, they're moved already. But when I did the research, I talked with them and also one of them is the musician. Uh, he was saying about that, you know, he was saying about this idea of uh, re-engineering like in engineering the, the world engineering the earth is actually to to communicate uh, to have this kind of like reciprocal communica uh, communication with the nature so it's like you know you give something to the nature in the um, uh, in the form of kind of like i don't really like the word preserving but they use it a lot like uh, uh maybe uh i don't know how to say it. it's maybe kind of like uh protecting maybe uh, instead of preserving and then then the nature gives you um the kind of like life that you uh, or like livelihood that you are um uh that you need to to sustain your life so i that's like the part about the the idea of engineering the earth but at the same time i also this is also kind of like the critique to maybe a geoengineering project which is a lot of people are starting to think about it's um somehow it's like a, a kind of like short term uh um uh yeah it's kind of like you know oh yeah earth is you know climate change and everything but uh happening but then the only thing uh, maybe not the only thing but the thing that we uh the thing that the scientific uh, let's say scientific community uh, not all, but like some of the scientific community thinks about this, uh, creating like geoengineering and, and stuff like that. But then for for me personally, it, it's kind of like a really short term in terms of like uh, solving the problem. It's not like uh, solving the core problem, which is the core problem for myself is the relationship between human and nature. Uh, as Juliet also maybe mentioned earlier, the, you know, the whole thing about Anthropocene and then and then humans see themselves as a kind of like center in the whole, um, uh, in the whole, uh, yeah, in the earth. So I guess that's kind of like try to look back like how the people, how the uh, indigenous people especially see themselves in, uh, in terms of relationship with nature. And yeah, 
I hope that answered the questions. <laughs> because it's kind of like, yeah. <laughs> It's it's really interesting what you say about this re mystic relation between um, between local people and nature and this. I, I think that this um, yes this this mystic dimension is also how, when you how uh, the way you you film also uh, the place. Um, uh, I, I I think of the, the the end of the film also with this sort of. Um, uh, sub sublime atmosphere with uh, the um, the slow shot uh, when you are filming the the, the workers who are uh, who are cleaning uh, uh, the area the area. So um, I wanted maybe to ask you about this uh, this end, which is really yes, there is something very sublime. Uh, and why did you choose to film like this uh, this last mm -hmm. last scene maybe? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a, uh, it's too bad that the film didn't show in theater because I was actually like really making it um, theatrical in terms of like uh, sound and images and stuff like that. But anyway, so the idea of this, uh, yeah, I always interested in in this kind of like Im immersive and almost trance, like a trance. Um, state like when you watch it and you just like immerse in the sound and also maybe in the images uh well but somehow i'm much more put too much attention to sound instead of images but uh yeah i like the idea of this immersive and then trans state it basically like uh the, also it, it's it's really uh relating to how the the idea of um you know the, the the musician in the end playing and then stuff like that the musician is basically also on in, in trance which uh, interestingly enough it's not it's really totally improvised so we were just going there and then he brings his uh sitar the kachapi sitar the instrument and then we talk we talk a lot about the what what my intention is and then you know what kind of films that i want to make and then he just like playing in the in front of the in on the on the ruins after I filmed the workers. So it's like, that's why you find a lot of like bottles and stuff like that. It's the residue or like the trash from the from the workers uh, a day before. So so yeah, so it's like uh, the this kind of like trans um, uh, condition or situation that I try to also like mimic and, and try to present. Um, yeah it's uh it's just yeah uh, it's just like really my interest with the uh, this kind of like uh state of mind where you you become some sort of like one with the sound and with the images i'm not sure if it's you know in the if the result is good or not but that's kind of like my intention is it's always that kind of like my intention okay <clears throat> uh yeah, I would like to to come back about uh, on, um, on the idea of ancestors mm -hmm. and uh, and the, the power coming from both nature and ancestors and on the communication. Mm -hmm. um, do you know if uh, at the Dutch uh, time, Dutch colonization time? Uh, this this place was what was this place? I mean, it, it, I mean, w w was it a place like a holy place? Huh? You know, uh, 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 did people used to come there to have some rituals or, uh, you know, um, I don't know if you know that. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's one po one point because it it could add on the way of. Um, because you you yeah you you film the, this site as a, again a powerful site a powerful place you know so it, this could come from also the past and for instance uh, are what is the use nowadays what is the use uh, not only for the musicians of course but for other people living in the neighborhoods mm -hmm. what, what what the use are they doing uh, uh, of this uh, of this place. And, and uh, I also 
uh, highlight that uh, the, the point that you said. I mean, you just said that uh, uh, the, for the local people, the mountain was for their own purpose, their own use. I mean, uh, their own life, actually, mm. not yeah. for technology. But it has been used for technology, and this is probably what can explain that the, the local people destroyed or looted or burned down mm. so easily, uh, easily or not anyway, but the, the, the station, Radio Malabar, Radio Malabar in 46, mm. uh, because they were afraid of seeing the, the Dutch coming back to the station. Mm. So maybe it was uh, also a way for them to to all we understand through this act also that um, this innovation and that was a technical innovation but we can see that for local people it wasn't seen this way probably mm. it was seen as a, a outsider project or i don't know so yeah yeah it's uh it's really interesting because the i guess the mountain the idea of mountain itself is in most places not only in jaffa but in a lot of island in Indonesia is always a sacred place, so mm -hmm. so that's that's also applied to this area. You know the the mountain the mountain Malabar Puntang and then Hamahera the the mountains around that area. It's also like sacred place. Mm -hmm. So, but at the time of the Dutch colonial uh, era, when I read the uh, archive, it's a uh, when they open the radio station, they also want to create this kind of like remote uh, gated community around that area, um, which is also really interesting because they they think that the 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 Dutch colonial think that the, the with the opening of the radio station it becomes like a new you know uphill city a gated community for mostly like a rich um, uh, Dutch people, and that's also like really interesting. But at the same time, also, of course, like oh, most of the workers are the local people around that area. So the construction workers and whatnot, it's always from the from that area. So I guess there's also like there's no like strong attachment with the site as a radio Malabar uh, with the local people, but still a strong attachment with mountains. So in terms of like radio Malabar, they don't really you know care that much. Uh, this is my assumption, so there's no like um, historical uh, writing about it, but it's also like uh, from the explanation of the people in that area. But then again, the people in that area, it's the dis you know like third degree descendants. It's not like it's not it's they always it's it's kind of like an oral history, so we cannot like verify it. But again, you know, um, uh, yeah, so. I guess that's also the reason why they loot, and also the other reason the looting is it's it's a big part when when the independence uh, happening in uh, the period of independence in forty five until like forty nine. There's a lot of kind of like um, uh, uh, a struggle or like the, the in, in Indonesia we called it like revolution time, and then in the, yeah, in the revolution time it was also like uh, there's a lot of abandoned. I don't know factories or like uh, yeah radio station factories uh, TV t television station is not open yet uh, 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 oh um, local what is it the train station and stuff like that is there's always a history of the uh, local people who are taking the the machine the the steel the yeah the technology or the the, the yeah the, uh, the apparatus. And it's it's really interesting because it's always kind of like micro history as well in Indonesia. Like for example, like I always remember that my grandfathers somehow have this kind of like audio feel uh, machine, which is at the time you know local people couldn't even have that, but he has he he had it and he always said, yeah, I took it from the Dutch house. So it's always something about that. I'm also like really interested how they see the advancement of technology and how they think it's some sort of kind of like. I don't know, like uh, like an object that needs to be taken. Um, uh, that's the the dynamic. It's interesting for me. And then the the story about looting. It's also not not come from me. But when I interview the the, the guardian, the, the 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 people who uh, who was kind of like paid by the local government to guard the area. He is the one who told me that yeah, yeah, it's it was looted back at the time. 
And I think that's kind of like relation is it's always interesting to see like the site is sacred, but the radio station is not. So it's like, you know, the, the nature of the environment is really sacred. Even until now, they, there's always um, kind of like a black magic practice happening in the in the area. It's, um, oh, I don't know what's in English, but it's kind of like meditative for asking some sort of kind of like money. And then they do this practice of sacrifice, not sacrifice, offerings. And, and then also in that area, there's also like the, uh, a cave built by the Dutch as, as um, not really far from the radio station. It's a, there's a, a cave a subterranean uh, way to uh, somehow kind of like bunker to kind of like protect themselves from war. And this place, it also become uh, not a sacred place, but a lot of people who are practicing this uh, uh, ritualistic and mag uh, and uh, quote unquote black magic always visit, mm -hmm. and, and that's also like really interesting. I always find this fascinating the dynamic of how the the site or landscape uh, somehow have a different kind of like understanding, and yeah, and and I think that's kind of like uh, my approach to it is is to show or to reflect this kind of like multiple understanding of sites not only from like one specific point of view, but like for many point of view, I guess that's also like the reason why it's called Tellurian drama in the end. It's the drama, the drama of people who are in, around that area and how they think about that area. Um, I have maybe one last question. Um, uh, so um, so what, what do you think about uh, this, um, this valuation of uh, this, this new value pro project of the state to, uh, to transform the place as a, a, a place of memory or tourist a, a tourist place, uh, and also what um, what are the what what do they, what the local people think about this project? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's a uh, it start it's it's I think it will be open this year later this year, but it's already starting. You know, I think it's 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 similar in everywhere the gentrification, and then now it becomes like. If there's one space and then we'll be like there will be like hotels or whatever around that area opening soon as soon as possible. I guess it's uh it's it's happening there. But in terms of like how the local people think about it, I'm not entirely sure because it's like at some point they don't really see well, they see this area as sacred the mountains, but not the ruins. So for probably for them it's fine it's like it's uh it's it's there's no problem for them with the with this and then maybe at the same time they also think about that you know it gives uh, some sort of i don't know income or whatever for for for, for that area so it's 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 the dynamic is really interesting i think it's totally different than for example like uh, uh sacred places like uh, there's one mountain in 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 Java called Mar Marapi Mountain Marapi in, in 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 central of Java. It's really sacred. You cannot open hotels, whatever. That uh, then then the locals will really really angry if you to try to do something about that. But in that er in this area in the area of Radio Malabar, I think they don't really care. It's a uh, it's it's for them. It's like yes, the mountain is sacred, but you know if it if if it if it gives us some kind of like income or whatever, then for sure, as as long as it's not really like, uh, quote unquote, destroying the ecology. But I'm not sure if, if it's not destroying the ecology. So that's kind of like the the drama. It's uh, it's, it's there, you know, like the um, uh, the i the idea of uh, opening always uh, opening these places as some kind of like a new uh, frontiers for like a tourism or whatever. But also on the other side, I'm not sure if it's also like attract tourists. So that's also like the, uh, it could be also a failure. So, so it's also the, I don't know. So it depends, like maybe we'll see in maybe five years or six years, maybe I'll make like a sequel, a Tellurian drama too. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for yes for this very uh, rich uh, discussion. It was really really uh, interesting and to how you speak of this film and we feel all uh, <laughs> it's uh, it was very very impressive. And I don't know if uh, Christine Cabasse you have something to add or maybe. 
Uh, no, the only thing I want to add is that next time I can go to Indonesia, unfortunately, as you know, in 2020, it was not possible, so I yeah. wish it would, be, it would be in 2021. But next time, I will pay a visit to this site. Yeah, yeah you should. Let's see, let's see how it develops. Yes. I'm also curious. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> cher euh, Riyar, cher Christine et cher Alice, euh, merci beaucoup pour ces échanges très féconds euh, autour de Tellurian Drama. Euh, cher spectateur, j'espère que vous avez pris plaisir euh, à suivre ce dialogue euh, à trois voix. Euh, nous vous souhaitons une bonne suite de festivals.